the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Chicago Cubs just made a huge groundbreaking trade as top prospect Michael Bush just got sent from the Dodgers to the Chicago Cubs in exchange for one of the Cubs' best pitching prospects and a very toolsy teenager who the Cubs just took in the 2023 MLB draft. The deal started out just with Yancy Almonte, a relief pitcher, heading to the Cubs and no other information beyond that, and suddenly the trade blew up. Michael Bush, who the Dodgers had long been considered holding back in the minor leagues, he's been major league ready for a very long time. Foolish Bailey even did a video on him literally yesterday regarding the fact that he's one of the oldest prospects in baseball, but still a top 100 guy. Ended up getting sending back to Chicago in exchange for two very young people in order to clear 40-man roster space. The Dodgers have a lot of talent at the major league level, especially with the additions of Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Tyler Glasnow, Shohei Otani. All these names are taking up 40-man space, and Bush is clogging it. Same with Almonte. So this deal was a great way for them to go ahead and clear some of that 40-man space to make more moves this offseason. For the Cubs, fans have been very disappointed that they haven't made any big acquisition yet, and this is exactly what they wanted. They are getting a bona fide MLB-ready player who can go ahead and contribute to their major league roster in 2024. It's exactly what Cubs fans wanted, and although it's not a big signing, the combination of Shota Imanaga and Michael Bush is now a very good way for the Cubs to bring in 2024 and really go ahead and try and contend in what might be a pretty weak NL Central in 2024. So in this video, we'll examine this trade from the Dodgers and the Cubs' perspective, see what each team is getting in these four players, highlight all of their successes, and how they're going to fit into the new organizations, as well as going ahead and giving trade grades to both sides, seeing what team made out well, what team didn't, and see if maybe they both made out well, or maybe they both didn't. Before we get started, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to the channel, there's a link in the description down below that will make you do it automatically. You can also hit that baseball in the bottom right corner. It really means a lot. It'll help my channel grow and also get you more baseball content, not only from me, but from other really awesome baseball content creators out there as well. Without further ado, let's dive into this trade that just happened earlier today and see exactly where each of the Dodgers and the Cubs land after this trade deal. The first name that broke with this deal is Yancy Almonte, a relief pitcher who has been in the major leagues already for six seasons, four with the Colorado Rockies and two with the Dodgers. He's had an up and down career. Some years he's been absolutely dominant. In 2022, he had an ERA below 1.3, but in 2023, he kind of struggled a little bit and that's just how his career has gone. He's had some really good years and some really not so good years. Again, his numbers in 2023 weren't phenomenal, especially when you compare it to a 102 ERA in 2022, but he did all right. A 3-2 record, a 5.06 ERA, and his peripherals showed that it was a little bit better than what it actually ended up being. A 4-3 Sierra, a 4-5-9 FIP, and he had the highest strikeout rate of his career. So it's not like he had a horrible year, it's just that he got a little unlucky with balls in play, and his lifetime FIP and Sierra have been lower almost every single season. So it might just be an outlier, and the Cubs are looking to really tap into what he could do heading into 2024. Almonte has a really two-pitch mix with a slider and a fastball. He throws each about 50% of the time, and he has a changeup that he'll throw kind of every once in a while, mostly to left-handed hitters, to kind of get them off balance. In reality, those are the two best pitchers. They're faster than league average for almost every single pitch he throws, and he does a really good job of not allowing hard contact. He's 93rd percentile in hard hit rate for all pitchers in 2023, and that's just something he's good at. He's not going to allow a ton of home runs. Pitcher's Park in Wrigley Field. I think this is a good idea to have someone who does not give a lot of hard hits up. I think this will minimize home runs, and when the wind starts blowing out towards the outfield and balls start carrying, Almonte is not going to be the guy to give up a ton of home runs, which I think is a very good sign for Cubs fans. They're starting to kind of retool, push a little bit towards the future, and I think Almonte will be a good piece to go ahead and bridge that gap from what was somewhat of a quasi-rebuild into more of a championship push in 2024 and beyond. By far the biggest name in this deal is Michael Bush, a top 50 prospect according to MLB Pipeline and almost every other service they're going to find, and the Dodgers' second ranked prospect there. Even Baseball America had him as the number one prospect in the entire Dodgers organization heading into 2024, and the Dodgers have a very deep farm system and a lot of talent, that's what they're known for. The fact that he's number one just shows you how good of a player he is and how good of a player people think he's going to be at the major league level big limitation about Michael Bush is the fact that he doesn't really have a defensive home. He was drafted as a first baseman and was originally expected to go and shift towards second base, but he never really stuck there, and maybe he can play some third at the major league level, but it just doesn't seem like his defensive ability is his calling card, and it's not going to be something that's going to really carry him. His offense is where it's at, and the Dodgers don't really have space to go ahead and carry Michael Bush. They have Shohei Otani DHing almost every day, 
especially this year in 2024. And then 25 maybe has a day off if he pitches or whatever that might be for the Dodgers. But right now, they don't have space for him. So this is a perfect deal to get rid of him. It's going to be a great player, but there's just not space in the Dodgers organization right now for him to play. So I talk about all these defensive liabilities. What's his offensive potential? And it is huge. He is a power hitter. He will hit absolute bombs in Wrigley Field, and he's going to do a very good job of getting on base as well. He's not a prolific hitter. He does strike out a little bit too much for a lot of people's likings, but there's still a lot of potential for him to be a very good hitter. I see him being a nice middle-of-the-order guy who can hit for maybe 30, 35 home runs on a good year, hitting somewhere between maybe 270, 280 on the peak of his career. I think there's a lot of potential for him to be a superstar at the major league level. As the Dodgers' first-round pick in the 2019 MLB draft, He's pretty old. He's 26. It's not like he's some young spry guy who's looking to come up and tear up the major leagues. A lot of people have already made their debut. I mean, I think the biggest example is Juan Soto, right? I'll reference that Foolish Bailey video again. Michael Bush is very old for a prospect, and there's definitely some prospects fatigue there, which means people who have heard his name for now five years, was 2019 was five years ago. I know, crazy. It's You've heard his name a lot, and now it's like, well, why is he still a prospect? Why is he still highly rated? It's his ability to hit for power to hit for average, and his ability to be a good player. Sometimes that's all you can ask for, someone who can just come in every day and provide you positive value, and that's exactly what Michael Bush is going to provide to the Chicago Cubs. Who knows exactly what their plans are for first base. Maybe they bring back Cody Bellinger. Maybe they you know, stick with Matt Mervis. You never really know exactly what they're going to do. Maybe he ends up playing third base. He's improved a little bit defensively there, but I still think his best bet is to play first base or to DH. Maybe he can slot in at left field if you really need him to, but for the most part, he's going to be a DH guy, someone you can maybe play in the infield, maybe play some first base if you need an off day. That's kind of his limitation, but that offensive potential is exactly what you're getting and what you're looking for out of Michael Bush. He's not a super volatile prospect, which is something that you don't often see. He's going to make a major league impact. It's just a matter of when. The Dodgers, it was going to be sometime in the next year, maybe, with a bunch of injuries with the Cubs now. He's most likely to make the opening day roster, probably start in the opening day lineup as well, and make an impact in April in 2024 instead of June, July, whenever injuries start to strike the Dodgers in 2024. Although Jackson Ferris is the biggest name the Dodgers are getting back, I want to talk about Zaire Hope first. I think this is a very good opportunity for people who maybe aren't as prospect inclined to learn a little bit about the behind the scenes of how the MLB draft works and why a guy who's 18 and very toolsy signed for a lot of money and so late in the draft. Hope signed for $400,000 in the 11th round of the MLB draft, and for those who don't know, teams are allowed a signing bonus pool for rounds 1 through 10 of the MLB draft, and that's how much they can sign all the players in those rounds for. You go over, you get penalized a little bit, and that gets increasingly more steep as you go over and over. Most teams don't go above 5%, as after 5%, the penalties become very, very harsh. If you're drafted in rounds 11 through 20, your max signing bonus is $150,000, unless teams want to go ahead and dip into that pool and take money from there. Oftentimes, you'll see teams take really good players in the 11th round because now they have an extra $150,000 that they can give to players that doesn't count against the cap. So an 11th round draft pick is a really good player a lot of the times because teams are now able to shift around their money and be a little smarter about how they want to spend it. That's exactly what the Cubs did with Hope. And the fact that the Dodgers wanted him, one of the best developmental organizations in all of baseball, this is a very good sign for him. He's six foot, just shy of 200 pounds, and he is a speedy left-handed hitting outfielder who has a lot of pop as well and has the potential to go ahead and be a very nice two, three, four hole hitter in the future. It's definitely safe to say that he will be on these top 30 lists when you see them reshuffled at the beginning of 2024. MLB Pipeline hasn't done theirs yet. Baseball America only has their top 10s, not their top 30s. Zaire Hope will definitely be on those lists, and even though the Dodgers system is deep, I think he has a lot of potential. One of the biggest things is he played a lot of right field in high school, but people are excited about his ability to stick in center field. Center field is such an important defensive position that if you can play it well, you can play it well, and that is huge going forward. If you have a player who can stay in center field and play some of the other positions, you now have a valuable defensive asset that you can move around the diamond. But if you're stuck in the corner outfield, it's a lot harder to play center field because you need that range. And Hope has that range to stick in center field long term. Pair that with some decent offensive ability and a lot of time to develop, and Hope could be a sneaky top 100 prospect in a year or two. I think the Dodgers made out really well here. Jackson Ferris was a Chicago Cubs second round pick in the 2022 MLB draft and signed for over $3 million. 
That's more than their first round pick, Cade Horton, signed for, which is just over a million dollars. And that's due to signability concerns. Committed to college, it's hard to sign away high school players away from their college, and sometimes money does a trick. Sometimes it doesn't, but in this case, $3 million is hard to turn down, and Ferris joined the Cubs organization and quickly became one of the best prospects. For example, in 56 innings pitched in A ball this year, he had 77 strikeouts, just incredible stuff, and he has a really great three pitch mix that allowed him to go ahead and be dominant at that level at only 19 years old. He has a very good fastball, it's elite, it has a really good late break to it that fools hitters and is a big reason why he is a dominant player on the mound. The ability to have a good fastball that can sometimes even hit 97, 98 is really good for a starting pitcher. And he also has a curveball and a changeup that are both above average that go ahead and make a really nice three pitch mix. He does have some walk concerns. He's only 19, so there's a lot of time to correct that. And if any organization can do it, the Dodgers are one of the best out there. Wouldn't be shocked to see him develop a sweep or two. They're really good at that as well. So there might be some changes to his arsenal, his approach, but there's still a lot of potential for him to be a very good player. If he can get those control issues down, he will be a very good potential number two, number three starter. Again, he's only 19, so there's no real rush to get him on the 40-man roster. So the Dodgers cleared out a lot of space there, which is always a good sign. We'll see what he does with the Dodgers organization this year. He'll probably be in single A or high A. Probably won't make the jump to triple A until 2025, but... We'll see exactly where he ends up at the end of the year. If he's really dominant, maybe he ends up in double A and really going ahead and making an impact and being a fast riser in this Dodgers organization. But he is a very good prospect, maybe a tail end top 100 prospect at the end of the year if he puts stuff together with a lot of potential. He'd be very, very good. Now to grade this trade, I give this for the Dodgers a A. I think Michael Bush was backed up and with teams knowing that, you have to be able to wait until you get a good return. They weren't going to be able to play Michael Bush anywhere on the field because he had way too much talent, and teams are going to lowball you until you know you end up giving in. They weren't going to do that. They knew they had to trade him for 40-man roster space, so might as well go ahead and get the best package you can. And I really like Jackson Ferris as a pitcher in the future, and the fact that he's so far off the 40-man roster is really good. And Zaire Hope is one of my favorite players coming out of the 2023 MLB draft. The fact he's going to a really good developmental team like the Dodgers only bodes well for his future success. I am so excited to see what the Dodgers are going to do with him. I think this trade works out really well. And Yancy Almonte, throw in peace. Yes, it's always good to have as much pitching as you can, but to clear 40-man roster space, I'm okay with it. He hasn't been great in 2023. They feel like they probably can do better without him. If I am the Dodgers, I trust them. Do what you need to do. I really like the players that got back, and I can't fault them for getting rid of a bullpen piece when, frankly, they have some pretty good pieces as well. For the Cubs, I'm going to give this a and B plus. I think they have a lot of talent going on into their 2024 roster, but they're not there yet. I think Michael Bush will be a good piece going forward, and I really can't fault them for taking a top 100 prospect. Might as well go all in. I don't love Almonte. I don't think he fits in their long-term plans. I would have liked to see them get someone a couple years younger who had a couple years more control under their belt, but I can't really complain too much about that. Getting Michael Bush is a huge win for the Cubs. They now have a piece that can slot in a DH, maybe at first, maybe at third. You have a lot of ability there to be a very good team with a nice young impact back in the middle of your lineup, and that's something that's hard to come by. And the fact they're able to get that for two young players who who knows what they're going to turn up and end up being, I really like this deal for the Cubs. This is a push in the chips kind of move in the future, not a push in the chips now move, and I think that's really important. When Dansby Swanson gets a couple years older, and now Michael Bush has a couple more years of experience, Imanaga comes in, four-year deal back end of that deal they could be competing for a championship with a couple more good moves this is a very good setup move for them thank you again for watching i really appreciate you guys sticking around this long there'll be two videos on your screen you can watch if you're interested and of course that baseball right there to subscribe to the channel or see more videos that aren't listed here thank you so much for sticking around i hope to see you in the next video